My name is John Passfield, and the title of this reading will be The Poetic Novel 1, Video 10, H.D.F. Kito, K-I-T-T-O. This is my book, The Poetic Novel 1, Influences and Elements by John Passfield. Now, it's not a published book, but can be accessed for free on my website, johnpassfield.ca. That's all one word. I'm going to read from a chapter in this book in which I discuss the contribution to my career as a fiction writer by the critic H.D.F. Keto. So note 10 in the, uh, in the uh, book of, of essays, H.D.F. Keto. My handwritten date inside the cover of my copy of Greek Tragedy, which was published in 1939 by H.D.F. Keto, is January 1969, when I was 23 years old, and which will be 50 years ago in six months. Well, that was 2018 when I wrote that. It's 2023 now, and I'm 77, so 50-something. Here it is, Greek tragedy, and I've had this uh, since I was 23 years old. Greek tragedy by H.D.F. Keto. I've had my the book on my bookshelves ever since, and I've read parts of it. Each time I have read a Greek play or watch one in person or on video. So I just keep going back to that and reading certain sections of it. No doubt Keto's book Form and Meaning and Drama gave me the title of my series of journals, In Search of Form and Meaning, and the other half coming from Proust's In Search of Lost Time. So I took two book titles and put them together, and one was a Keto book. At this point in my life, I would say that it's odd to have a literary critic who's been a lifelong touchstone for me and have to say that he has both helped me in my thinking and left me without operative input at the same time. By this I mean that Keto concentrates on two things, two dashes, one and two. The key concepts by which to understand the thoughts of a particular author, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, and two, a particular play, such as the Agamemnon, the Oedipus Tyrannus, and so on, which is not what I want from a critic of the literature that intrigues me nor from my own observations I read and think about authors or individual items of literature. Similarly, what has been frustrating for me over the years about Keto and all the other critics whose work I have read is that they seem to discuss the role of specific choruses and specific plays, but never seem to delve deeply into the concept of the chorus as a literary device in terms of the role of literature its role in literature as a medium of human interaction. So they discuss what a particular chorus is saying inside that play. I want to know what a chorus is as a literary device. How does it work? What does it do to suggest meaning? Where I seem to deviate from the critics whom I read, and perhaps from other readers, that I never want to know what a certain reader, writer, sorry, what a certain writer means by his poem, play, or novel. Now, what the poem, play, or novel means as a literary artifact, I assume that neither meaning can be known. What I want to know when I contemplate a poem, novel, play, or the entire work of an author is what I, John Passfield, think as I'm stimulated and provoked by the work of art that I'm contemplating. Not what the author thinks, but what do I think when stimulated, jostled, poked, and prodded by this work of literary art. It is my response to a work of art that interests me, not the intention of the artist nor the objective meaning of the work of art. Now, when I became a writer at age 53 in 1998, I wanted to know how Aeschylus or Sophocles generates meaning by the form of the works, so I could, by borrowing and modification, generate meaning by the form of my own novels. I wrote in a recent planning notebook or journal that a topic on which I've been brooding for 50 years, but about which I have no thoughts which I can articulate, is what the concept of the chorus in Greek classical drama is offering to me in my efforts to develop the form of the poetic novel for my time. So this will be an essay with some news for me as well as for any readers which it might have in future. I should add that I've often been intrigued by the idea that the Greek tragedies all have a similar form, 
With this form being adaptable to individual temperaments, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, that this universal individual adaptability strikes me as a key concept in my search for a poetic form for the novel. So a form that you can play variations on. Both are important. Form, everything the same. Variations, something's changing. That's what I was looking for, for the form of the novel. I think I've found it. So in this essay, I will collect some quotations from Quito's Greek tragedy on the topics of form and chorus and mull them over. Here I will disembody Quito's quotations from Pacific plays and consider Quito's comments on ancient Greek drama in light of my own development of a form for contemporary poetic novels, contemporary 2023. That a service to Quito will be worth the benefit to myself in developing and clarifying my own understanding of my own literary program. Okay, section two is a quote from Quito's book. In this flood of poetry, music, and dance, the chorus lay the perfect medium, not for the presentation of the thoughts of an individual, but of the emotions of a group. So the quote seems to say that the chorus is not an individual. They are a group, a group expressing its emotions. Okay. What I like about this is not so much the presentation of emotion, but that the chorus can be seen as a method of presentation, a literary device which works in tandem with the traditional literary presentation of an individual in a certain situation who is trying to think or his or her way out of an impasse. So we have an individual uh, in a play or in a novel, fine, but how do you get more into it than just that individual, his thoughts and actions? That the classical Greek chorus was not realistic in that it was a formal presentation by a group with choreographed movements and speaking patterns was a benefit in overcoming the natural human tendency to prefer realism and presentation. The ethereal challenge in serious literature is how to incorporate literary devices which serve to suggest significance while presenting characters in situations which are recognizably human enough to be pertinent to lives of the readers and viewers. So any play or novel to appeal to us should seem to have recognizable human people and activities. But to get more meaning into it than your everyday event, it has to have something that isn't all that realistic. How do you do that? Okay, it's the third section, another quote from Quito. A chorus essentially dramatic, expressing the urgency of some tragic situation and bringing to bear on the actor some moral or spiritual force. So pressures on the individual, forces that work on the individual. Ah, yes, okay. Here's my response to that. This concept appeals to me as it posits two entities, the mind of the main character and the forces which are seeking to impinge on his or her thoughts with these forces embodied in verbal imagery. The Greeks simply divided the actors into two segments. One, the named characters, eventually three, who are subject to the forces that press on the lives of all humans, and two, the chorus, which represents not so much these forces, but a human awareness of these forces as either active or potentially active in our lives. The Greek form of drama blended the realistic, the besieged by life character, and the non-realistic, a group of voices chanting imagery, present presentation of life in a very simple way, and the non-realistic entity could present imagery which seems to be complementary and harmonious or antagonistic and threatening to the main character to voice the forces of building up and tearing down, sometimes alternately in the same place. So forces at work on us. How to get that into a novel or a play. The fourth section, another quote from Quito. The essence of old tragedy was a solitary hero facing his own destiny, or playing out an inner drama of his own soul. Very contemporary, I would say. My response. This has implications that stir thoughts in me concerning my own conception of literature. That a Greek hero faces his own destiny, the Greeks would probably add, is forced to face his own destiny. And we moderns and postmoderns would probably alter this to say, 
faces his own situation squarely, honestly, openly, and with no dissembling, is a fascinating concept. That the main character is not just faced with some serious decision making, but is actually defining his own soul, his own essence, I would say, is also appealing. I would say that a novel of mine, two items here, one, presents a situation in which the main character finds himself or herself, and two, the character is engaged in the thought act of defining his or her own essence. The character is engaged in the thought act of defining his or her own essence. However, the question as to why we cannot write tragedies anymore seems to me to be due to two differences in thought between myself as a 20th and 21st century person and these ancient writers. Two items, here's number one. I feel that we false to imply a sense of certainty in the writer, that he or she is representing consensus in the culture which is producing the work of literary art. And number two, I feel it would be a case of presenting the writer as a false authority if the author were seen to be determining the significance of the circumstances in which the main character finds himself or herself. So in my novels, three points. Number one, the main character is given the opportunity to face the reality of his or her circumstances. Two, he or she might or might not actually take the opportunity to face that reality. And three, he or she might or might not actually act on that opportunity. Further in my novels, the significance of the circumstances, the opportunity or lack of opportunity to face that reality, the acceptance or avoidance of that opportunity, the rightness or wrongness of the character's response to that opportunity, and therefore the definition of that character's essence are left to the author as just another reader without omniscience, the main character and the reader, to determine each in turn as a solitary person playing out an inner drama in his or her own mind. So the book goes into the mind of the reader. The reader becomes the main character. What am I thinking if I am in the situation of this main character? The three author, main character, and reader no longer meet in the same room to agree on their conclusions as they did in former cultures. We of the 21st century are no longer invited to view a character in literary work we are invited to become that character. There is no character unless we imagine him or her, that we become the main character of a literary work or fail to become that character is the inner drama of the reader of a contemporary novel. Now, as can be seen, I tend to use these essays as occasions to access and explore the kind of novel that I write. It's an attempt to better understand what my subconscious creative mind is giving me when it writes the novels. You can read the entire essay on my website, johnpassfield.ca. For now, I'll read the conclusion to the keto essay that I wrote at that time. So here's my conclusion to the essay after having left a lot of the essay out. Keto taught me to try as hard as one can to respect the author as an artist before deciding that a work of art is decision deficient in some aspect. So. Don't decide there's something wrong with the book until you've done all the thinking you possibly can. Respect the artist. A member of a library board told the librarians that my novel, Reign of Fire, should not be supported in my hometown. This was my hometown because the author had made a mistake in the last chapter. So the library board had one person read it. He said, oh, let's not promote this novel even though it was written by a person who grew up in this town because it has a mistake in the last chapter. A little more thinking would have revealed that the main character had made a mistake, but that the author had not. Keto sometimes ties his logic in knots in favor of the great Greek playwrights, but his method is one that has stuck with me for 50 years. Trust the author as long as you can, and then ultimately trust yourself as a skilled reader. But don't bail out early on the literary logic. Such a method of approaching literature has kept me thinking about pronouncements by another mentor, T.S. Eliot, who saw Hamlet the play and Othello the character as failures, till I finally figured out what his pronouncements meant for my own writing project. 
A discussion of this topic can be found in my recent planning notebooks and journals and no doubt will continue in future books of mine. So just not dismissing someone, but saying, okay, not only what is he thinking, if there was more detail in his thought, but what do I think when a person says something that seems so ridiculous, right? Last year I saw a copy of Keto's book, The Greeks, in a used bookstore in Brantford, Ontario. Canada, about 20 miles from my home. It was as if I was meeting an old friend, Keto himself. Here it is. I'll hold it up so you can see it. Yeah, one who had set me on a train of thought which has provided enjoyment and profit for 50 years. So 50 years apart, I bought two paperback books by HDF Keto. And if you think about it, he lived and worked in England. I'm in Canada. Uh, so it's kind of nice for an author to think that your books can travel all over the world. And somebody can actually be glad to see one of them if he sees your name on it. So that's kind of nice. Okay, here's a, uh, a note on another aspect of novel writing. The technical term montage, I would take to mean the breaking up of the information of an original experience and presenting that experience from various angles so that first it seems to be a series of fragments held together topically by the fact that all fragments are taken from the same original sequence of events. It seems to be used sparingly in the contemporary popular film, and I would assume that it's also used sparingly in a temporary popular novel. Few filmmakers who wish to be popular would make an entire film using the technique of montage, such as we find in Eisenstein's film Battleship Potemkin. The novels and films which employ montage sparingly are an attempt to tell a story in as clear a way as possible, uh, so as to make character setting dialogue and event readily available to the reader or the viewer. This is the way we tell our stories to one another. However, it is not the way our minds actually work. As we are living through an event, we tend to perceive those events as of the surface and sequential. However, once we have lived through an event, we seek to understand the event by scanning it retroactively for potential meaning. The mind, in attempting to do so, seeks out a multiplicity of points of view. In order to see as much potential meaning in an event or a situation as is possible, the surface of our mind, our conscious mind, does review those events in sequence. However, the depths of their minds the level at which we think in imagery is constantly turning the sequential events of our lives into a montage of multiple point of view images in order to better understand the possible meaning of those same situations and events. With reference to the two aspects of human mental perception, the conscious and the subconscious, the poetic novel is a novel of... montage and the prose novel as a novel of surface single event narrative so two entirely different kinds of novel so this is my book the poetic novel influences and elements by john passfield you can uh, access it for free on my website johnpassfield.ca if you're interested in this kind of topic uh, the writing of novels and the nature of novels thank you very much for watching this video